Welcome, strangers, to Talkumentary, a show where we watch documentaries and then get together and talk. Welcome, everyone, to the 49th episode of Talkumentary. That's right. We are almost 50 episodes old. Can you guys believe that? Nope. Feels like it's been just yesterday since we started this. It, it wasn't, but yeah, we just started this. <laughs> um, tonight, we are going to be looking into what I consider to maybe be one of the most frightening situations uh, involving a family and their struggles with a healthcare system, a heartbreaking story that unfolds because of it. First, let me introduce our crew for the evening with me tonight in the studio in the documentary den. None other than Bruce. Bruce and the juice is loose. Bryce. What's up, Bryce? What is up is, um, you know, things above us. Yeah. But, uh, like the, um, the vaulted ceiling. <laughs> yes. The vaulted ceiling. <laughs> okay. Joining us tonight from over the waves of the internet. Um, she is not with us in, uh, proximity, but she is with us in spirit. Uh, all the way from another state this time. Welcome back, Lady Katie. Thank you so much. Hi, Hi friend. I wish I was. I don't wish I was in the snow because I drove. Yeah. I yeah. The uh, the the weather in certain places has been pretty awful. We did a my family and I did a little vacation to. Um, uh, Colorado and we got, we had to drive in the snow a little bit and, uh, it, it makes for a stressful drive. You know, we were fine, but it just, it, you, you add a whole new level of stress as, as you're going. So, uh, thanks for being here, Katie. Let's get a few things out of the way. Please go rate and review our podcast on your favorite podcast streaming service. Let us know what you think of our show. If you want to connect to our crew, look for at Documentary Podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. YouTube. Or you can shoot us an email at info.documentary at gmail.com. This week, we stayed on the edge of our seats in this nerve wracking and probably, you know, in, in my opinion, one of the most terrifying ones that we've watched just because it's so real and it happens so often. Also one of the saddest by far. We followed the story of a family that tries desperately to understand 10 year old Maya Kowalski's super rare illness and find proper care for her until they start to be questioned and accused of things themselves, resulting in Maya being taken into state custody. We watched a 103-minute documentary from 2023 titled Take Care of Maya. Here's the trailer. We as parents tried to do the best we can for our children, but there's nothing that could prepare me for what I went through. Nothing. Beata and I had a beautiful family, but then Maya started to get sick. Maya had advanced complex regional pain syndrome, and we know what the best therapy is for it. It's called ketamine. We were just blessed that we finally seen something working, but Maya relapsed. Beata's explaining to the emergency room, this is what needs to be done. You don't understand how much medication it takes to control her pain. But they didn't listen. They accused Beata of medical child abuse. And that's when they told me I had to leave. That my daughter is under state custody. They would try to convince me that my mom was doing things to me. I do not want my child to suffer. She is still my child. Our family was falling apart. You're going to cause more problems. I'm fighting for my child. How should I feel? No matter what we did, the court sided with the hospital staff. Judges don't care about evidence. You don't get to the truth by accepting what's in front of you without questioning it. And I realized that this was a lot bigger than just the Kowalskis. How many times are you allowed to be wrong and destroy lives before they say, OK, that's enough? These families walked in hoping for help for their child. 
and some of them walked out in handcuffs. Wow. What a film. This was uh, nerve wracking from beginning to end. Um, what did, what were you guys, you know, after listening to that again, being put back into the world of the Kowalskis, what, what do you guys think? What's Katie impressions? First, first impressions after, after your watch. To know that such a debility these can affect a child mm. that they have to suffer that like that. But um, your life can be so changed and affected by people who decide they're going to take over and there's nothing you can do about it. That's terrifying. It's so scary. So scary. Bryce. Oh man. Um, first, just the fear of it, trying to get the right diagnosis yeah. and, and all the trouble that they had to go through for that mm -hmm. to finally understanding it and having treatments and then not being able to continue those mm -hmm. and then revert back into that state. Right. Yeah. It's really scary. Um, this was directed by Henry Roosevelt, produced by Caitlin Keating. This film was a story syndicate and wise. This was a story syndicate and wise fool production, distributed and streamed on Netflix. Take care of Maya scores a whopping fresh ninety-two percent on Rotten Tomatoes with thirteen. Uh, critics reviews and an audience score of 95% with over 250 audience ratings. Here's a few of the reviews that I read. A fresh review from someone named Chris Vognar of Rolling Stone says, quote, take care of Maya allows you to feel the agony and anger of a nightmare from which they can't awaken. The film leaves a bitter taste along with the hope that they eventually get the closure that the film knows it can't supply. And a rotten review from Natalia Winkleman of the New York Times says, Take Care of Maya is grueling, but it also odd, but, uh, but it is also oddly deficient, wanting for the precision and perspective essential to deriving insight from profound trauma. Um, I find myself disagreeing with Natalia there. I don't think this was deficient at all besides in the happy ending. <laughs> I, I would have loved that, but you know life does not always give you a happy ending. Um, which unfortunately that's what some documentaries are here to, to show us, unfortunately. Um, anyway, we're going to have a link with the credit information in the show notes. Let's get into it. Quick warning before we get into this episode, if you haven't seen the documentary and you want to see it, uh, this is your spoiler alert. Also, there is some talk of suicide in this one. Um, for no spoilers again, but uh, that is a topic that is discussed in this episode. So if you still want to hang out, glad you're here. Let's talk about why we chose to watch Take Care of Maya this week. I was dealer for this week, and basically I wanted something new. <laughs> this was a very recent documentary. This was um, something that rated very high when I, you know, you, you Google, Google search best documentaries of 2023. Uh, this is on most of those lists. So that's it. <laughs> that's my reason for picking it. Um, had either of you seen this, Katie? Uh, had you heard of this, seen this? I know you're a little bit more um, up to date on some of the new stuff coming out than I am. I'm like the guy who remembers stuff from the 90s and, uh, you know, you're a little more up to date. Was this something you were aware of? Heard about this case when it started okay. talking about how they were keeping away um long before it became <clears throat> what it is now and we'll talk about it later what's happened since mm -hmm. it's come out I remember reading that they were keeping the parents away from the kid at the hospital and it just shook me to my core mm. how, how can you their parents from their children when they're trying to make them better at a hospital and i just for one second couldn't even fathom that a hospital was trying to do something right mm -hmm. for them when this child was and yeah. what kind of person could do and you know it started in 2015 but they were talking about this case years ago so this documentary took a long time to make but they've yep. been talking about it for a long time too. yeah it took a long time to make and it also 
took a very long time to to conclude. And at the end of this documentary, we didn't even get a true conclusion. And I know there's been some updates since then, like Katie mentioned. So, and we'll get into those, but, um, Bryce, how about you? Is this, was this new to you or was this something that you were aware of? Oh, this was brand new to me. I, I didn't even know, you know, what the title, what it was going to be about exactly. Yeah. Um, but it, it jumps right into it. And, uh, was it anywhere near what you were like predicting? Take care of Maya. Were you, did you have any clue that like, did you? Nope. 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 Yeah. I no. <laughs> you, you went into it blind. You didn't watch the trailer or nothing. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, that had to, had to be a little shocking then. Cause I, at least had watched the trailer before going into it. And so I knew kind of what to expect, not the details, but you know, mm-hmm. kind of, I, I can imagine that was probably like, who, what did I just get? What did, what did Jeff just get me into? Yeah. Yeah. That's, I sat down to watch it and was like, you know, we'll just, just start it and, and see how it's, how it's going if I'm feeling it. But, uh, I, I couldn't really turn it off. So it was, uh, it, it does a really good job of, uh, bringing you in. Yeah, for sure. You know, as we watch documentaries and, you know, inundate ourselves into whether it's social media, news outlets, things like that, it seems like more and more we're sh- being shown behind the curtain of some of the big institutions that we're supposed to be able to trust. You know, we've covered several of those documentaries here, whether it's, you know, police that you're supposed to be able to trust or, you know, the justice system or or whatever it may be you're supposed to be able to trust them for your own well-being and more and more we're being shown that there there is always darkness behind every every curtain and they are often some of the most dangerous and life-altering things that we experience in our lives it's not some slasher in the hallway sure or in the alleyway or whatever you know you you've got the stories of these horrible things like that but more often than not the horrors in your life come from the most, the things you're supposed to be able to trust, whether it's, you know, domestic violence or, uh, violence from police officers or, you know, unfair treatment in the judicial system or whatever it may be. And to me, that's one of the worst things that we have to contend with. (laughs) I'll take, I'll take my chances with a slasher in the alleyway any day over having to, having to not be able to trust these systems that are supposed to have my well-being. Um, this one focused on the healthcare system and more specifically the power that that system has to take children away from their parents when an allegation is made against a parent and that that allegation doesn't have to be proven. That, you know, Katie, I'm 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 going to have to probably like push questions towards you just because uh, you're over the airwaves and I don't, it's probably harder to, to insert yourself because there may be a little bit of a delay here, but I'm interested of in your opinion or in your um, perspective, I guess on the, if you have one of the system, not needing proof, but just a, uh, what they call probable cause of this and how much power they have. Did that strike you as, as shocking as it struck me? Yeah, well, it was kind of astonishing because when I was a teacher, I had a student that had a bite mark on her arm. And mm. she told me after a bit of sitting down crying that it was her mother. And so I'm a mm. mandatory reporter and I told my principal and they called the cops. And at the end of the day, she went home with her mom. Mm. And it didn't matter what she said. Or what policies we had there was nothing there was no one they could send her home with they wouldn't put her up in foster care they wouldn't protect her yeah. she, she she made down that she wasn't going to go home with her mom and it's one of my biggest regrets and yeah. so hmm. to see that need to prove abuse right to just say that and they could take her from her parents is astounding because right. that's not the system before so that just to me says they have a lot more power mm-hmm. than what the teachers. Yeah. And, you know, I would hope that in, in, in the creation of the, of giving this sort of authority to these systems and to these people and these doctors, you know, the hope is that you can get that child to safety 
without having right. to without having to cut through a bunch of red tape. I assume that that's why it's there, right? Because if you if you if Maya in this story was truly an abused young lady, then you wouldn't have you wouldn't want to have to go through a bunch of red tape to keep her safe from her parents that are abusing her, right? But good lord, there's got to be some better checks and balances than this because in the story which we're we're getting into there was proof that they weren't doing anything wrong and that proof was ignored and it was more of it it was another you know just like uh what was the one we um uh dream killer the the one that I did with my sister the episode we did where it, you were they they went to such great lengths to protect their original decision and protect their their uh, reputation that it damaged a family beyond repair. And to me, that's, that's very, very sad. So our documentary starts with out with audio clips of people talking about, uh, how their lives had been ruined by the system. We hear how, about how some people would rather be shot than have their children take away, which, you know, if you're a parent, you can understand that. And then we roll right into the Kowalski family, Lovely memories from the beginning of the family. Beata, a Polish immigrant whose tenacity and never give up attitude allowed her a lot of success in her life. And when she met Jack Kowalski, they fell in love, started trying to have children. And eventually, after some failed attempts, they had uh, little Maya. And a few years later, they had a son named Kyle. Beata was a nurse. Jack was a retired firefighter. And they are doing pretty good. Things are going pretty good for the, the Kowalski family. So... Bryce, talk to me about the beginning of this film. Um, mm -hmm. you, you went into this film without knowing what was coming, with the exception of those clips at the beginning when yeah. they said, you know, I don't want my t kids taken from me. And then we roll into the Kowalski family, the happy, normal, you know, everyday family from mm -hmm. Florida. And, you know, immigrant mom, firefighter dad, pretty good thing. Yeah. They How were you feeling at that point? Oh, I felt great for a while. Yeah. Because they set the stage really well. They yeah. introduce um, all the family members mm -hmm. and they talk about, you know, they try, had to try to um, have Maya. Right. Um, but they didn't have to try when they had Kyle. Uh, it's just, yeah. Yeah. He just came. Uh, uh, whoops. Yep. Just yep. there. There he was. <laughs> yep. Uh, <laughs> you know. But I would imagine, it, like like me, you probably heard the stuff at the beginning, and you knew that this wasn't going to stay sunshine and rainbows, right? You know, yeah. and so so you've got there's something so ominous about seeing the beginning parts of a of a show where you're going, oh, I just want it to stay happy like this because I yeah. know it's not going to. Candy, were you feeling that too? Like in a horror movie, when the family's all happy. To a new house and everything's mm -hmm. going great and then slowly your audio cut out just a little bit you said slowly what happens like in a horror movie yeah when the family moves into the house and everything's happy somebody's got a job <laughs> and the kids are great and then slowly you watch it all fall apart as some ghost comes out of the wall uh-huh <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 we knew something bad was gonna happen here and uh, it, it sure did. I just wanted to live in that happy moment of this montage of family photos. Right. Hey, can we go back to that and clips? stay there for a while? Yeah. <laughs> um, in 2015 though, Maya started to, to get sick. She starts having a lot of pain all over her body and her arms, legs, feet. She can't move very efficiently. Her legs start to turn in. Um, she's having a lot of congestion, breathing problems, respiratory infections, headaches, Blurred vision, warm skin. Um, Bryce and Katie, neither of you are parents yet, but what what do you think would be your first reaction if this sort of thing starts happening to your kid? What I mean, what without having seen this documentary, you know, Katie, what do you what do you do if if you're oh your little cat that's back there? What if what if cat gets sick or or if you if you are a parent someday? Katie's been through a lot. And so, I mean, if my kid's instinct is to go get help and find out what's wrong, and you would listen to whatever the doctor said, because obviously they know more than you. Right. So if your dad is sick in this, mm -hmm. then you do it. Right. 
Bryce, I mean, that that's your knee-jerk reaction, right? Call yeah. medical? <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I don't know how to fix my car, so I take it to a mechanic. Right. Like, uh, if it's a child, then, yeah, definitely take it to a, a professional yeah. doctor. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> um, they did the same thing. They start taking her to doctors. They say, you know, and doctors all over the place, they're going, because no one seemed to have any idea. It wasn't like they, they were getting answers they just didn't like. Right. They weren't getting any answers. Mm -hmm. They were going, Are my child's in pain and we aren't we aren't getting we're getting uh throwing their hands up. <laughs> I don't know. And you know, Beata being the nurse that she is and understanding how a lot of this works, she starts documenting everything. She's, you know, taking uh audio recordings, she's writing things down, she's taking video, which later in in this story proves to to be a, a good, a very good thing. And after searching and searching and searching, they finally f come across a doctor, Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick, who without hesitation says he knows what she's suffering from. And that is a condition known as CRPS or complex regional pain syndrome. Had, had either of you ever heard of CRPS? Nope. No, nope, me neither. Here's a little clip about what CRPS is. I first saw the Kowalskis in September 2015. It was obvious what the problem was with Maya. It was clear and simple CRPS, Complex Regional Pain Syndrome. This videotape has been prepared in consultation with Dr. Anthony Kirkpatrick. What is Complex Regional Pain Syndrome? The best way to think about it is the way it evolves. Let's say you have an injury you know that probably in a week or two, the pain's going to go down, the swelling's going to go down, the redness and all that's going to go down. But what happens in these patients with CRPS is that it actually intensifies over that period of time. Published case studies indicate that the incident of CRPS increases dramatically between 9 and 11 years old, and it is found predominantly in young girls. The patients describe it primarily as a burning sensation that their skin becomes exquisitely sensitive to light touch. Picture a floating feather, soft to our touch. Patients say this feels more like a knife stabbing their body. The syndrome was first described over 100 years ago, but it was only recognized in modern medicine in the 1990s. Still, many don't know the problem exists, and many of those suffering were told the problem was psychological and imagined. After my initial evaluation for Maya, it was clear to me that because of the magnitude of her symptoms, the lesions, this burning sensation in her legs, and the pain throughout her entire body, that Maya had advanced CRPS that uh, we had to right away get aggressive with and get under control. So this is a condition that had been around for a very long time, like they said, and was only treated as a psychological issue for, for quite some time. Um, as if it were something that patients were essentially dreaming up or creating inside their own heads. And that's such a scary thing to say and to assume because unfortunately our brains are a very, 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 very powerful thing. And we can, we can convince ourselves of things, but from where I'm sitting, it doesn't matter if you're feeling those things whether it's coming whether it's a psychological issue or not are the issues of our brain and of our mental health are just as important as any of our physical ailments and if that's playing on itself then we still deserve you know treatment of some sort and you know Dr. Kirkpatrick then goes into the the very effective drug that treats it and that is called Ketamine. Ketamine. So that's right. Cat tranquilizer. Cat Valium. Jet K, Kit Kat, Purple, Special K, Special La Coke, Super Acid, Super K, Vitamin K, Ketamine. Those are the street names for it if you guys aren't hip enough. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm not, but now. Now you are. If anyone says, I need some Jet K, you can be like, well, go talk to my veterinarian because, yeah, it's often used and abused recreationally because of its, it, it causes hallucinations. It causes you to feel disconnected, uh, not being in control, as well as a state of being calm and relaxed um, and a relief from pain. 
correction, it's not a relief from pain, but from what I read about it, it's more of a detachment from your pain. So when you, you, you stop caring as much about being in pain. Katie, were you saying something? There's a little bit of a delay on our, our audio, so. I was just going to add that when the doctor says, oh, it could be psychological. That's a very common thing that I know women are used to hearing yeah. uh, when they talk about pain. They, oh, it's probably just in your head. You're probably just doing it to yourself. Yeah. And I think that's unique. They would start with a, uh, with a 9 to 11-year-old. Um, this pain is in your head. She doesn't know how to do that. She doesn't understand how that works. This right. pain is very real to her. And even if it was somehow connected to a psychological disorder in her head, her pain is still. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I completely agree. And regardless of whether that's your assumption or not, you, you treat it, you know? Yeah. Good. And, and I mean, the lesions and the legs turning in, mm -hmm. Like that's not in your head. That's physical. Yeah, yeah it's you coming from somewhere. Yeah, I didn't fake this lesion. I didn't fake my my legs turning in. I didn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. What anyway? Um, ketamine though is truly a medical drug. It's not just a recreational thing, and if used properly, can help many things. CPRS. Uh, being one of those things. Kirkpatrick basically says that ketamine stimulates the brain, resets everything, increases circulation and breathing and blood pressure, all things that Maya very much needed. Um, and they tried her at a low dose, as you would, and that wasn't helping. So they decided she needs a medically induced ketamine coma. A five to six day coma procedure that basically amps up her body on ketamine and then when she wakes up, the hope is that she feels a lot better because her body is completely and totally reset. It's almost, I, I, I took it as like when your computer's acting up and you can't figure out why you turn it off and then turn it back on. That's essentially what it felt like. And, um, however, it's an experimental treatment and it's only available in Mexico. Okay. This is where my red flags as a parent would start going off. <laughs> I feel like if, if I was told you got to go to Mexico for this experimental ketamine coma, I might be more hesitant than what it seemed like the Kowalskis were. Katie, thoughts on that? No, um, I had new drugs for migraines. Mm -hmm. When my grandma's, we wanted to be an experimental drug trial. Mm -hmm. Um, if it's experimental, doesn't work or that it hasn't been through drug trials, but the FDA to regulate it needs a lot of different things. And uh, just because the FDA doesn't regulate it doesn't mean it isn't safe. It's also, what did we say in that one documentary? It's the Food and Drug Administration, not administration. And they get hmm. paid off for a lot of different So I guess if it's not approved, if it's still in the in those stages and a doctor told me that it would work, I would trust that doctor. I mean, I would do my own research, obviously, like this family has done, but I would be okay going to Mexico to get a treatment that could help my daughter. So fair enough. That's that's a good uh, that's good insight there. I I know when I was watching it, and to me, I went, "Ooh, that doesn't sound that doesn't sound too safe." It's interesting to hear it the way that you you put it, though, because that makes that makes total sense to me too. Um, you know, it's a lot easier if they say you know, it's a experimental, uh, or it, it's a, it's a treatment that only a few doctors know how to do and, and they're at the Mayo clinic. So you've got to go there. Well, okay. To me, that feels less risky than going, it's a sp experimental treatment that we don't do in the United States and you've got to go somewhere else. Yeah. I'm going to consider it, but man, I, I just felt like there was no hesitation there, which, you know, Maybe she, maybe Beata knew something that, you know, about this and, or it was just very trusting. So, yeah. I mean, you're watching your kid in this health, um, just degenerate mm -hmm. and you're given the choice of try this or continue to watch health degenerate. Um, because all the other doctors are throwing their hands up saying, we don't know. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yep. tough choice, but yep. But yeah. they, they end up going to Mexico and they get the coma treatment. She comes out of it. Um, you know, obviously it was it was kind of scary watching her come out of it. She had the shakes. He was calling it the wiggles. <laughs> um, you know, 
but it ultimately was a huge success. She goes back home, you know, they, she starts to feel better. She starts, uh, you know, they're still giving her ketamine treatments. And I know at one point she was feeling yeah, better and she was doing like, uh, like kind of pull-ups or you know push-up kind of things on her walker or something and and mm. her mom's like you're gonna need an extra dose of ketamine after this you know because yeah. you're gonna be sore um but you know dr kirkpatrick still you know giving them prescriptions for ketamine and um he eventually has to pass them off to his colleague dr Han hannah um who because he, dr kirkpatrick was too expensive and didn't accept their insurance and whatnot um but things are going pretty pretty well and you know, that had to have been a, you know, that right there, I think, is the the reason that as we move forward in this story, that they were so sure of themselves, that Beata was so sure what her daughter needed, because they had seen the transformation, they had seen it, they weren't just guessing, they were, they, they'd seen, you know, several months, what, um, you know, I'm trying to remember when they went when they went to mexico versus when she had her relapse uh in 2015 or 16 was it 15 or 16 october hurricane matthew anyway it doesn't really matter too mm -hmm. much for the story but things are going great until october i have 2016 on my notes so maybe that's right anyway hurricane that sounds right yeah hurricane matthew hits um has nothing to do, I don't think, with the relapse, but it's just the timing of the the story. Um, Maya has a huge relapse, and the family decides they have to take her into the hospital. Uh, this is a decision and that they, uh, they regret for the rest of their lives because um, they take her to Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, they go... Seems like a good plan. The hospital name is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, you... Some of the the biggest that's one of the biggest names in medical research and and uh, yep. progress and you know why wouldn't you yep. trust that and yeah but they get there and none of the nurses in the emergency room or the triage know, even know what CPRS is which is concerning and thankfully I, I guess thankfully. Beata is a no bullshit mother um, and she's a nurse who yeah. knows exactly what her daughter needs. And she starts stating these, these things uh, very aggressively to staff. And that's kind mm -hmm. of what got her into, I think some hot water because um, that is sort of what is stated throughout this whole story. You know, if you watch the documentary, you know this, um, but when a doctor or, or nurse who isn't familiar with this treatment plan sees that Beata and the family have been giving her so much of a drug like ketamine for symptoms that a lot of medical professionals still consider to maybe be a psychological thing, um, the hospital's red flags start going off, right? And they start to question the parents, right? So I can understand the questioning of the parents if you're not feeling comfortable with what's going on. But the accusations and the and the what happens after that, that's what doesn't make sense. Right. Um, but unfortunately, when they start to question the parents, this sends Beata into a bit of a tirade um, because they aren't helping her suffering daughter. And Jack and Beata start talking about taking Maya out of the hospital and taking her somewhere else. Well, of course, this causes the, right. the hospital to say, well, you're not leaving here with her. We're calling CPS, Child Protective Services. Enter the Honorable Dr. Sally Marie Smith, a pediatric physician with CPS who was given Maya's case. Oh boy, Sally Smith, mm. the villain of this of this show, in my opinion, or at least one of them. One of them, yeah. right? Um, before we go any further. I, I'm curious, did you guys at any point, at this point or any point in, in this documentary, start to question the story and what Beata was doing at all? Bryce? Um, question the story as yeah, far as... Yeah, did, did you have any doubt about like whether 
Dr. Kirkpatrick was kind of a quack and that mom was way too quick with ketamine or giving her too much? Or did you think that like we were maybe being thought to believe mom was doing right, but we were going to turn into like mom was actually doing something really not cool? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I mean, we got to see um, the effects of the treatment and she mm-hmm. was able to raise her arm and mm-hmm. put it behind her head that yeah. she mm-hmm. wasn't able to mm-hmm. before she was going back to school and, right. <laughs> and things were turning around. So not really. Uh, yeah. I, moms are aggressive uh, they can when be. their kids are in mm-hmm. pain. Yeah. Um, so mm-hmm. yeah, no, I was on Beata's side. Yeah. Katie, I, I saw you shaking your head. Uh, no to, to that you you were you were team Beata all the way, huh? A mom fighting for their kid is a lion, mm-hmm. and she watched her daughter suffer for so long before they found anything that made her feel better. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, as a parent, you would say you'd rather suffer for your child than watch them suffer. Oh yeah. So I'm sure that's all she wanted to do was to take that pain away. So then to watch her get this treatment and finally feel relief and be able to go to school and mm-hmm. move even to walk <laughs> right. was just so, such a relief, so uplifting. And to have that cure and no, or maybe not cure, but a treatment right. that works and to walk into a new hospital that doesn't believe you, that doesn't understand what's happening. You, the very first thing that I would do would be, okay, here are our results. Oh, sorry. That's all right. <laughs> here are our results. This is what our doctor did. And guess what? It worked. It doesn't matter if you haven't been studying your periodicals, if you haven't been reading up on mm-hmm. these chronic diseases that happen to kids, because I already know what works. So right. here it is. And this is what you're going to do. And she's going she's gonna to do everything she needs to to take right. care of her kid. And the first person that walks in her way and says, no, is going to get run over. So. For sure. Yeah. I, and I I can I agree with with all of with both of you and with the way Beata was behaving and and all that you know to an extent I do think that had she gone about things a little differently the <laughs> result may have been a little different too but that's not to blame her that's not to anything like that because because you know she was dealing with the the in the moment and she was doing things the way that she felt she needed to do it. Um, but I will say that there was this was the part in the the documentary where I started to question wh- whether we as the viewers were being led to believe one thing and then we were going to get a big twist or something like that because I didn't know this story mm-hmm. beforehand. So I I was going, oh boy, I really hope that it doesn't turn out that Beata was doing something. You know, because we've seen the the stories of Munchausen by proxy, and we've seen we've seen the the documentaries where it turns out the mother was was stirring lead into the kids, you know, drinks or whatever. And, what? and what was that, Katie? Oh, I was just saying you're right. Um, yeah, you it was doing like maybe the documentarians were doing a bait and switch. Yeah, very possible. Yeah, so I, I started to to get skeptical of what we were being led to believe. I, you know, with as sad as the story is, I'm glad that I was wrong about that. Um, but anyway, so Sally goes. Sally, Doctor Sally uh, Smith. She goes in to talk to Maya and Jack. She doesn't identify herself. She starts asking questions for for a whole 10 minutes, yeah, which is, you know, plenty of time to to get to know what's going on. Uh that's sarcasm. In in this time she comes <laughs> to the conclusion that despite the statements by Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hanna, you know, two renowned physicians in their own right, that this is a case of Munchausen by proxy or medical child abuse, and she's putting all the blame on Beata. So this woman, t- to me, this should have all been over when they called Dr. Kirkpatrick and Dr. Hanna. Mm-hmm. This should have all ended. Right. They should have given care to her primary or her specialist, who is Dr. Hanna and Dr. Kirkpatrick, and they should have been the ones to say, no, the parents have done nothing wrong. We This is exactly what we prescribed and what we've told them is the treatment. So you will not do that. I don't understand how they didn't have more of a say in this because that right there is proof that yeah. they didn't do anything wrong. And I mean, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick, he had the video of before right. and after. Like you can see like, 
the progression of getting better. Yeah. Yeah. And, so to me that that was that was totally uh whack. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Here, whack. I'm I'm gonna play a clip real quick. This is when Jack is told he has to leave Maya because she's now under state custody. She did a 10 minute interview at most. And shortly after she walks out. There was ample evidence to support a diagnosis of medical child abuse. And it appeared most likely that Mrs. Kowalski was the primary one who was perpetrating the child abuse. The nurse walks back in that was helping me. She told me I had to leave, that my daughter is under state custody. I remember looking in my daughter's eyes and she's looking at me. I'm wondering if I would ever see her again. So, so now what? You know, what do you do in a situation like that as a father, as a as a mother, as a sibling, as a friend? You know, what what do you do? What do you do? Plan an escape. <laughs> right. Yeah. Jailbreak. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. what the Kowalskis did was what I think a lot of people would do is they immediately lawyer up. They say, I need yeah. legal representation because this might be more than what, what I can argue. I can't, it, it, Beata's done her damnedest to argue with the, the doctors and the nurses to give her, you know, that custody. And um, they decide, you know, it's it's time to lawyer up. And I think that was a good call. They find lawyer Deborah Salisbury, um, named after the stake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, maybe. Uh, who who basically tells them how much power CPS investigators have to take children away. And like we said earlier, they only have to give probable cause, not proof of abuse. And what a load of horse shit. Like we talked about, I understand the need to get rid of some of that red tape for the immediate care of, of a child. I get that. But man, they, they accuse them of over-medicating of doctor shopping. So when they were, uh, when they earlier were going around and uh, trying to find specialists that could tell them what was wrong with their daughters rather than, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know what to do. They, they called that doctor shopping. Well, that's not what it was. And the, the lawyers believe that like what Katie was saying, when Beata, the, the mother lion goes into the, hospital and doesn't let anyone stand in her way and is you know we heard her recordings of her basically calling them assholes basically calling them witches and liars you know she offended someone the lawyers believe that this whole thing stemmed from Beata having offended someone at that hospital and you know whether it was Dr. Smith people are people. go go ahead Katie I'm, I'm sorry, sorry. Because- the wrong time i just said people are petty bitches <laughs> yeah they really are especially when you're a you know a professional in a field and you think that you're untouchable and you think that you know your your word is you know your your ego gets in the way of a lot of things and when this irate mother comes at you saying you don't know what you're doing and i do somebody went <laughs> and you know got all up all up in their shit um and again this all continues even though dr kirk patrick gave a statement to dr smith saying they aren't doing anything wrong this was prescribed to maya sally marie smith sounds like a real bitch <laughs> i think she might be i think she she might be i'm not a big fan of sally smith at least not from what I can tell. From I think the world would agree. Yeah, I, I think they would. I think they would agree. Um, as could be expected in a situation like this, the situation puts some serious strain, unfortunately, on Jack and Beata's relationship. You know, their daughter is imprisoned in a hospital where she, she isn't allowed to talk to them, see them, or anything. And Beata is basically banging down the doors of the hospital, demanding to be able to see her and that they give her daughter what she needs. Um Jack, on the other hand, is trying to play a little bit more of a compliant role 
um, and follow what the orders are so they can get back to seeing their daughter. He's saying, uh, you know, if we keep being aggressive about this, it's just going to be used against us and it's going to make this take even longer, which I can see both sides to that argument. I can see Jack wanting to say, hold on, calm down. I, you know, we need to, we need to comply because we need to get back in that room with Maya and mom saying, no, these motherfuckers don't, you know, understand my daughter and I'm going to fight for them. I understand both those sides. So, Mm -hmm. so like, you know, I, I get it on both sides and but it does cause a rift between a man and, a, and his wife, I'm sure. Um, or a woman and her husband, however you want to um, phrase that. Anyway, uh, Beata is calling the nurses, witches, liars, assholes, and even their attorneys are telling her to calm down because it's just hurting their case. The more irate she gets. Um, this all leads to a shelter hearing, which is basically when a judge will decide where the child goes for the time being and the judge ends up giving a no contact order between Beata and Maya, which this is when Beata falls out in the court hearing. She completely passes out and and hits her head on the ground. And, you know, a really sad part to listen to. <laughs> um, but Beata being Beata still fights. I really like her name, by the way. Yeah. Beata is such a good name and it's it's like very easy to say. And it sounds so like powerful. I like the name Beata. <laughs> it's a good name. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm I glad like I'm it. not the only one like who thinks it. so. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, we, we listen. So a really cool part of this documentary is that we get a lot of audio clips that Beata had um, recorded. So we don't, it's not just, you know, being told the story of the conversations that happened. You're hearing the actual conversations, which to me is everything. I love hearing the actual conversations or seeing the actual footage. Um, The child parent advocacy people are telling Beata to stop trying to prove that the hospital did wrong. At this point, the, the courts don't care. It's already happened. Whatever happened has happened. The courts only care at this point about making sure that if they give that child back to Beata and Jack, that they're not going to end up regretting that because the parent goes off and kills the kid or something like that because that looks bad on the system, right? So whether or not the hospital did something wrong at this point, they're saying it doesn't matter because you've got – what you have to do now is prove that you're not – you have to try to prove that you're not a risk to that child, right? And you – getting all up in arms now trying to, to, to get into that hospital room. It's showing that you might not be a stable person for her to be with. And Beata says, I understand, but I'm going to keep being aggressive because my child's in there, not getting the care she needs. Mm -hmm. God, what an awful place to be in being told that you, that what you're fighting for and all that, you need to stop fighting so hard because uh, it's making you look bad. Like, I don't give a shit if I look bad. I want my daughter back. I want her to get the care. Even if I don't get my daughter back, I want her getting the care she needs. Even if I don't get to see her right now, this isn't about me. This is about Maya getting the care she needs, (laughs) you know? And what are we feeling at this point, Katie? Like when, when, Beata just keep, keeps getting told, I can't, you can't be in there. You're not going to see your daughter. You, you can't be involved in her care. And when you do talk to her, you know, you can't talk about anything. You know, you're going to have, you're going to have Kathy Beatty listening in and, uh, you know, mom, mom, reel it back, roll it back, mom. Stop calling me mom. I'm not your mom. Yeah. That was, that was a really annoying part. Oh. Katie? Was this the um here? Was this the hearing when the judge said, where she asked if she could have a daughter, and the and the judge said no? Not quite yet. This was the first the first hearing, um, when they were deciding where they were gonna, uh, where they gave the no contact order between Beata and Maya. Um, this was like their first time in front of a judge. I think if you have a vicious animal that is trying to get somewhere and you put it in a cage 
is not going to stop being vicious. It's mm. just going to start frothing at the mouth and keep chewing at the bars until it until it dies. And that's mm. essentially, yeah, you know, that's a good way to, you know, not good. That's a that's a accurate way a to <laughs> compare. Yeah, because that is exactly what ends up. Excuse me, happening. You know, during all of this, we're getting like some testimony from other things and like text messages. And I don't know if these were real text messages that they were showing. I, I were led to believe that they are right. Yeah. Um, and it, all it said was, you know, between a doctor and Dr. Smith or between doctor number one and doctor number two, mm-hmm. you know, there's these text messages that they're showing, which was a really cool way to, to keep, and a documentary interesting to show images like that uh, throughout. I thought that was well done, but they're basically showing that these doctors at the hospital don't fully believe that Maya is actually sick, that her mother's a whack job and that Maya's being Maya being in their care is making her better. They're claiming that they see Maya using her feet, you know, when nobody's looking kind of deal, they say that a 10 year old can't keep up a charade 24 seven, you know, and they had cameras on her the whole time. They start saying that she's moving around better, gaining weight and weaning off medicines and everything. And Maya and Jack are claiming she's not getting better. Mm -hmm. They're saying some days are better than others. Sure. But that's nothing new. This is, this is just me, you know, dealing with my pain better and worse on different days, depending on the day. And, um, you know, tomorrow I might not be able to move at all or whatever it may be. And they're not really looking for evidence. They have a theory and they're looking for proof to support that theory. It's confirmation bias. Absolutely. So they're not really doing anything helpful. Right. Because if they were to say, if they were to uh, uh, for any minute start believing that what Maya and Beata and Jack are saying is true, then they made a big fuck up. And right. So you're one, like you said, confirmation bias where, you know, we made this call. We need to, to look for all the reasons why this was a right call. And, you know, rather than, than trying to. So we hear again from Dr. Kirkpatrick, who actually he writes a letter to Beata, which do, really doesn't do anything to calm her down because, you know, it, it causes her to actually go even harder at this. He He writes her this letter telling her, Beata, you are absolutely correct to be fighting this. He says the the diagnosis of a, quote, fictitious disorder is a way for the hospital to conceal their incompetence. He tells her that this will lead to a prolonged and unbearably painful uh, death for Maya. You know, you get a letter like that from your doctor, Mm -hmm. doctor, the only doctor who's ever really helped Maya who says it is fucked up what that hospital is doing to your family and to Maya and she will die and she will die painfully if she doesn't get out of there and get the treatment she needs. Oh boy. How do you handle a letter like that? You know, like that. I don't know how you do. Yeah. What can you even do with that information? I mean, I, I guarantee you, I guarantee you that if, if Beata had found out a way to, you know, like ninja sneak into the the hospital and sneak her daughter out of there and take her to to Mexico and hide for the rest of their lives, that she would have done it. There's no doubt in my mind that if she could have figured out how to do that and keep Maya safe, whether she was running from the law or not, she wouldn't have cared. You know, she seems like that kind of a mother to me. I, I think even when the system is so terribly wrong you still somewhat believe that it will turn around and Mm -hmm. things will be righted. Um, Yeah. So I think maybe that was also part of not probably the fire alarm and throwing smoke bombs down the hall. And yeah. Yeah. Going in like, like Deadpool or something like that. And yeah. Crashing through the window and yeah. Yeah. Um, But you're right. I think that's a good point. Like she is a part of the medical system. She, you know, she's hoping that through, whatever that they're going to realize that they were wrong and that she was right. Not because not for the sake of saying I'm right, you're wrong, Mm -hmm. but because you know, it's putting trust in a, in a system that was made to help people 
and it's not helping right now. Um, anyway, we then meet social worker assigned to Maya, Kathy Beatty. She's a real annoying, uh, see you next Tuesday. Um, they, they, uh, they find out that they just do a simple Google search of her and they find out that she was arrested for child abuse at one point in her life. Did you read the little letter you that was on the screen? You should not be allowed to work with children after that. How are you a child social worker it that's been arrested for child abuse? Only because the case got dropped. So... Yeah, see this? Oh, I was going to say, you have to be fingerprinted by the FBI and the police department when you become a teacher. Yeah, see? But but Maya claims that Kathy Beatty was telling her things like, you're going to be in foster homes, and your mother was going to a mental institution, and I'm going to end up adopting you. Yeah. She was the worst, probably, you know, you, you've got villains in this story, right? Mm -hmm. If, if, uh, if Sally Smith is the Joker, this Kathy Beatty is Two-Face or the Riddler or something like that, because she's just as, as maniacal and, and much creepier mm -hmm. because she ended up forcing Maya to strip down to her bra and shorts and yeah. take pictures, even though she was uh, protesting, Maya was protesting, claiming that if you want to get your hearing, you need to take these pictures. And yeah, if you want to go to the hearing. Right. <laughs> yeah. And and they never, they, she admits to never having gotten permission to take these pictures. Uh, never, you know, she, she admits to having Maya on her lap and giving her hugs and things like, oh, my skin is crawling now reliving that let alone how they must have been feeling after that it was so gross and you know the fact that after all of this no one ever really had to pay any consequences besides some money mm -hmm. to this yeah. family because of this i mean you should nobody be, went to jail you should be in prison yeah that yeah. is wrong that is wrong on so yeah. many levels um so Maya's still in the hospital. Well, let's, let's go ahead. Let's take a side check for a second and think about all the people, all the kids that are in foster care huh. that they're trying to reunite with their families, and these kids get killed by their parents. They they get pulled out for possible uh, child abuse, and then they end up back in the same home with their parents. And we hear about these kids that get killed by their parents, mm. babies that are killed by their parents. And they get pulled out for possible child abuse when the teacher reports it, but it doesn't matter. And they get put back in the house. So what is the difference here right. between kids at home with their parents and now a hospital? Is it just the power that the hospital has? Is that the big difference? Oh, God, that could be. <laughs> yeah, that, that's everything's jacked up. <laughs> I that's... hate it so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maya's in this hospital. And time is passing. Christmas, birthdays, other family things are happening. She's praying to go home. Her mom's telling her to be strong and they'll be together again soon. And at this point in the documentary, we hadn't heard anything besides recordings and videos from Beata. Well, that doesn't bode well. You know, you, you I'm expecting at some point to hear from her in an orange jumpsuit or something like that. Like she got put in prison or something. I didn't know what had happened in this story. Um, but we're about to find out why we hadn't heard from her. There's a, a court hearing um, to try to allow Maya to go back to her parents' custody, and it is denied. Um, and at this point, the attorney asks, would it be all right for Maya to at least give her mother a hug? And the judge very coldly says, not at this time. It's not okay. Um, this is the the decision that that very possibly was a a straw that broke the proverbial camel's back um because soon after this jack and his son kyle attend a birthday party to which beata stayed home claiming she had a headache shortly after getting home uh, they find her in the garage she had hanged herself the judge denied her that hug 
and it killed her. It, it's such a sad, heavy part of this documentary. Watching Jack struggle with how his relationship with Beata had been, you know, his part in these investigations, his guilt, and ultimately, how do I tell my daughter that her mother, that she never got to say goodbye to in the hospital, because when they found out the mom wasn't at the hospital, her mom ended her own life. And in a lot of ways, they they believe that this was because Beata felt that the only way that Maya's ever going to be released is if I'm not in the picture anymore. She had convinced herself in one way or another that it would be in Maya's best interest if I was no longer this problem. God, how sad is that? I don't even know, like, but but you could you could understand how months and months and months of this mental and physical torture cause a person to start to doubt themselves, cause a person to start to wonder what they can do and what is in their control. And unfortunately, this was something that was within her control. Um, and the hospital staff are calling her and telling her she is the problem. Right. She's been told she's been the problem since the very beginning. And she carries that with her while she tries to save her kid and mm-hmm. she can't. And you're right. I think that added up to her thinking for a very long time that the only thing she could do to save her daughter was not be around anymore. Right. And that's just hard. It's so heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Beata left a few emails before she went. And first she sends an email to Judge Hayworth. This is the judge that denied her the simple hug. She says, your heart is made out of iceberg. By taking the side of ACH and DCF, you have destroyed my family, my marriage. You have put us in bankruptcy, and you still denied me to see my daughter in court today. Further, you let them continue to destroy her even more, slowly each day. My daughter will never be who she was before October 13th, 2016. I hope you will take responsibility for, quote, my daughter's physical deconditioning, worsening of her CRPS and eventually lead to her slow, painful death. She quoted Dr. Kirkpatrick saying that you, Judge Hayworth, are responsible for what Dr. Kirkpatrick says is inevitable. Um, she wanted Maya out of the hospital so bad she somehow convinced herself this was the way to make it happen. She also wrote an email to her family. It said, please take care of Maya, which is where we get the title of the, mm-hmm. the documentary, and tell her how much I love her every day. Please tell Kyle also that I love him very much, and I hope that he grows up to be a strong, good man, has great future, and stays close to God. I'm sorry, but I no longer can take the pain of being away from Maya and being treated like a criminal. I cannot watch my daughter suffer in pain and keep getting worse. It's been three months today of Maya not being home. I love you all, Beata. You know, probably one of the saddest parts of this whole situation to me was Beata's suicide was seen by some of these doctors at the hospital as being an admission of guilt um, in some way, uh, reinforcing the fact that they responded the right way to the situation. We get, uh, we get some more of those text messages we saw earlier um, them saying, well, see, we've seen this before the, you know, we made the right decision, blah, blah, blah. Um, kind of a, a silver lining, I, I guess you would say. And the way I saw it, something that made Beata's death feel a little less meaningless, I guess, um, is that this did cause the courts to allow Jack to take Maya to another specialist in Rhode Island. So, for as heartbreakingly sad as this was, ultimately what Beata wanted happened after she died. And because of her death, mm-hmm. it caused them to get another opinion, which they already had another opinion, actually two other opinions with Kirkpatrick and Hannah, but they didn't want to listen to those ones. Um, when this doctor in Ro- Rhode Island evaluated Maya, he gave an unbiased do- diagnosis of CRPS. 
the <laughs> same thing that Dr. Kirkpatrick had diagnosed her with and that all the other people in the hospital were convinced was fake. And because of that, Maya was released to Jack's custody shortly after. But we're not done yet. Mm-hmm. Jack had to follow some pretty strict court instructions about Maya's care after she got home. They had to stop ketamine treatments for some reason, which I don't really understand. They had to do years of physical therapy, and ultimately Maya stays in a lot of pain. But thankfully, as she gets older and and time goes on, she starts to get back on her feet, begins moving around better and being able to function better. You know, in the original, when we listened to the clip about what um, CRPS is, um, it said it, it affects most often it affects girls between, I think it was nine and 11, which was right was where she was. And she's starting to get a little bit older. I don't want to know. I don't, I don't want to say that she grew starts to grow out of it a little bit, but maybe that's a thing. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know, but, um, they do understand that she could relapse at any time and they're adjusting to life without Beata, which is very not easy. Um, Enter reporter Daphne Chen at this point. So basically, before Daphne Chen gets involved, the the story's kind of concluded. Would you agree? Like they kind of, it kind of seemed like they were, they, they were maybe going to keep fighting for, for some things, but they didn't really have as much of a case or anything like that before the report. The... Maya was free. They were, she was back at home. She's getting treatment, not the treatment that they felt that she needed, but she was getting treatment and she was starting to get better. So story is kind of wrapped up. Um, Daphne Chen decides to publish a piece about the Kowalski story and she digs into the people involved, such as Dr. Sally Smith, Kathy Beatty, all of the people at the hospital. And, and, and she puts it all out there. Of what about what happened? Well, sure as shit, the calls start coming in, the emails start flooding her with very similar situations. People who had their children taken away, people who are still in prison for medical child abuse that they did not commit. And what all of these families had in common was what? Sally Smith and Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Every one of the stories that rolled in said that was the doctor who put me out and that was the hospital we were in. Mm-hmm. Talk about terrifying. Families come in looking for help. This was a, a Daphne Chen quote. Families who come in looking for help and they often walk out in handcuffs. I mean, you walk in to get help for the child that you love and you get accused of something that's so fucked up. Mm-hmm. After all... Well, and what is she... out? Of- like, what is she getting out of that? If she's not right. making money, she doesn't have kind of business on the side. What do you get out of separating families except some sort of sick sort of joy? It doesn't right. make any sense. No part of that makes sense to me. Me neither. Me neither. If it was all coming from different places around the world and or around the country or whatever, then it's like, okay, well, I can understand maybe if you're looking at these things and it's more of a, a it's a more of a procedural thing or it's more of a, you know, what what are your what are your policies that are being then then how can we adjust those because this is a problem. It's coming from one place and one person. Mm-hmm. You know, not to say that that's the only time it's ever happened in the country or in the world, but these stories, the amount of cases just from there. Right. It's insane. And and at this point, after hearing this news, Jack's tired of being quiet. He says, hearing all these families who were affected, he decides to act the way Beata would have acted and he just and he described and he decides to fight hard. Um he goes and gets a kick-ass group of attorneys together. They start pushing to sue. Um this is where all that documentation that Beata was taking came in real handy because they had the true story from beginning to end timelined out for them and no one can really challenge it because they already had every bit of, um, of information there. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, also because they knew she was right about her daughter's condition because she knew that she was right. Beata never agreed to a case plan. So I'd never heard of a case plan before this. Had you guys, were you guys familiar with any of that before? Mm. A little bit. A little bit. Um, 
So basically a case plan is a checklist of things that you agree to do as a parent in order to get your child back. Okay. Things like you have to attend an anger management class or you have to go to couples therapy and blah, 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 blah. You have to do all these things. You have to check in so often, you know, whatever it may be. But what what's probably in the small print in that thing that you sign, you're releasing the hospital from any liability. So yeah, that's the part. Right. That's the best part, right? The 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 real good juicy part of the of the uh document. So most families, a lot of families do that, you know, pretty much right away because it's the easiest, quickest step to getting your children back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll go to an anger management course if that means that I get my child back. Man, it'd be hard not to sign that. Yeah. You know, um, even if it says, well, you're also saying you can't hold us liable. It's like, well, the important part here isn't getting rich off of you making a fuck up. It's about getting my child back. Right. But Beata, didn't do it. She never did that because she was so convinced. I am not going to make you not liable because you are liable for this bullshit. Now, whether that was the right choice or not, I don't know. We don't know what kind of case plan was ever presented to her. If she even had the option to sign one, because we never heard any story about them saying here, you can have Maya back. If you sign this case plan, you know, you think that we, that they would have mentioned that in this if they were, but the, the, Truth of the matter is she didn't sign one. She never signed one. So they can sue. And during this process, they find a huge piece of evidence to put against the hospital and these nurses. They uncover invoices. So Katie, you've worked in, in finance and billing before. It all comes back to the numbers, right? Where money is. Yep. And the money doesn't lie. The numbers don't lie. Right. And what they did. So Johns Hopkins, all children's hospital billed the family for three months of treatment for CRPS, meaning that this disorder that Dr. Sally Smith told the courts that Maya didn't have was being treated for at the same hospital she was being held. So what you're saying is she did have it. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's poking... It's actively treated for that they were denying. So exactly. in court... You can't say that she didn't have it if you were actively treating her for it. Exactly. It's just, it doesn't add up. So, you can't win it. So you're either billing them for something that didn't really happen or, which is. Which, which would go to jail for. Right. Or you lied on, on the under oath saying that she didn't have something that you mm -hmm. knew, knew she did have. So either way, right. it's, it's poking all kinds of holes you in her. <laughs> what'd you say? I said they're fucked. Either way, they're fucked. Yep. There's no yep. way out. Yep. Um, however, after all of this, we find out that the court case keeps getting pushed um, because the second district court of appeals has to decide whether or not they're going to allow punitive damages in the case. And until they do that, the case is indefinitely postponed. So basically what that means is red tape. There's it's, it's tied up in red tape. People are pushing to say, you know, it's just being held indefinitely and they keep getting told we're not going to choose a jury we're not going to push for a trial because at this point we don't even know what all is going to be used in this trial right it's and when they say punitive is i'm pretty sure they're talking about emotional pain oh, like yeah. things that are hard to quantify and they they were they knew they were going to have to pay through the nose oh, through yeah. punitive damages all day all day yeah. and you know but judges kept saying, we're not going forward with trial until we know what's going to be on the trial. And which, you know, I guess makes yeah. sense. Yeah. But it, it's, it's legalese. It's red tape. It's, it's tied up in the muck, you know? And, um, one thing I, I, I want to kind of, you know, we're getting toward the end of the story itself. Um, one part that really was powerful to me was a letter that Maya wrote for her mom. I want to play that real quick. I want to speak, but I just, I can't without crying. I hate crying. It's okay if you have to cry. It's, it's normal. You have to speak for yourself now because mommy is not there. 
Just close your eyes and pretend I'm there. I know it's not the same, but just be strong. If you're watching this, Mommy, I want you to know that I love you. Send you kisses. You'll know it's from me. Dear Mom, saying that life has felt fucked up since you left is probably the biggest understatement I could make. Dad, Kyle, and I have all had to adapt to your absence. Dad distracts himself by helping the neighbors with painting projects. Kyle does his best to escape by fishing for hours. When pouring all my energy into my schoolwork got to be too exhausting, I started to book every second of my free time with friends, outside of the house and away from reminders. But as soon as we step foot into our home, we are brought back to reality. We miss you. I miss you. For five years, we have been promised our trial. Yet it seems that the closer we get to a set date, the further it gets pushed. Even though we are discouraged, we will not settle. We will fight for you, and we will fight for the thousands of other families who find themselves in the same unfortunate circumstances. Our day will come. I love you. So I thought it was really cool, the the filmmakers taking audio from Beata through all of the phone calls and things like that and putting it into the final kind of scene of Maya talking to her mom. When Maya says, I, I want to talk, but I can't talk without crying and I hate crying. She's cried out. You know, she, she, we, we, we didn't talk about it much, but when she freaks out during her death, deposition um saying how dare you ask me why i'm why i don't like hospitals and doctors mm -hmm. you did this to me your system did this to me you know and you know she's tired of crying and they they splice her mom's voice in saying it's okay to cry god to pull on my heartstrings already because you know <laughs> right Katie, katie's over there a ball of tears already you know but but the it's a, it's kind of where, you know, we, we get a little bit of information toward the end and, but it's kind of where we leave off with them saying, we're going to keep fighting mom. You know, we're going to, we're going to do what you would do and the best that we can, you know, we get a, an update at the end. The second district court of appeals has decided to approve the Kowalski's request to pursue punitive damages against the hospital. And the court date is set to September 11th. 2023. Um, at the time of the court date, it will have been 2,530 days since Maya entered the hospital and the last time she saw her mother. Uh, it should also be noted that in December of 2021, Dr. Sally Shithead and her, her poor, <laughs> she, she settled her portion of the lawsuit with the Kowalskis for two and a half million dollars and declined to interview on this documentary. Um, Smith never faced any formal professional consequences for what happened with the Kowalski family. However, she did retire in the summer of 2023. Um, according to the cut and but did have her license revoked for some reason. Say that again. She did not have her medical license revoked. Nope. Nope. Uh, according to the Cut and Women's Health magazine, an attorney for John Hopkins says that, quote, Dr. Smith is a very competent, very professional, and very valued member of our medical staff. She is an independent pediatrician who is on our staff as a consultant 
and an admitting physician. But in the same breath, he reiterates that Smith has never been an official employee of Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital. Um, no, she never, she never got, she was able to retire, kind of go off the grid. She paid two and a half million dollars in, uh, in a settlement to the Kowalski family. And, uh, that's it. That's it. Um, since this documentary was released before the court date, our show happens after the court date. And I went ahead and I looked up, uh, what happened Hmm. and, a jury found the hospital guilty of false imprisonment and battery of Maya, um, as well as fraudulent billing of her father, Jack, which I'm assuming is the, the charges for the CRPS. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, yeah, that's gotta be an easy decision there. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and inflicting emotional distress on her mother, Beata, which led to her death. Um, they were awarded $261 million, um, which doesn't bring your mom back, but, um, I am glad that that had to have hurt (laughs) that had, they had to have felt that, you know, I wish it had been more of course, but, um, at least it wasn't like, here's a hundred thousand dollars, go do your thing. You know, it's like, yeah, this is, you know, a, a significant amount of, of, money because you went through a significant amount of, you know, maybe there's people out there, maybe you guys disagree with that. How do you guys feel about that, um, that verdict and that, that sentencing? No amount of money is going to bring her mom back yep. or that time that she was locked up there for no reason. Right. So if anything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Katie, what are your thoughts on that, that decision? Same as Bryce. Um, These insurance companies prop up these hospitals with billions of dollars. So I don't think 261 was nearly enough. They should have gotten close to a billion dollars for imprisoning a child. And at least the jury determined that the abuse and emotional damage done to her mother was done by the hospital and led to her suicide. That's a big admission of guilt to get. uh, But um, based on all the money the hospital has, it probably didn't even make a dent. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I think. They just had to cause pain because of the pain that they cause, and right. nothing's really going to make that better. But right. I oof, just I remember watching the clip of Maya and her brother looking at the jurors, and they each stood up and said guilty, and that was pretty emotional mm. for them. And I was just going to get emotional again. Yeah, but <laughs> they did what they could, and um, they got what they could, and yeah. they got the the hospital to admit guilt and that's a really big deal and it'll be a high precedent as people move forward and especially in that town for other families that were treated that way they're likely to get more money because based on that precedence yep the thing the thing that disappoints me the most like like i agree there's no 100 there's no amount of money that that makes the pain go away there's no amount of uh of money that you know that this is not an amount of money that truly 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 hurts an organization like Johns Hopkins, I'm sure. Um, but the, the thing that, that probably disappoints me the most out of all of this is that nobody was held accountable. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, yeah, personally Hmm. there, nobody had to, to truly, I, I would have very much liked to see somebody go to prison even if it was just for a little while, a couple years, even if they said you did your job the best you could, but you really fucked up, so you got to answer for that, you're going you're going to you're going to show them that you give a fuck about that. You're going to show other doctors who may be taking their their position too lightly and not covering the gray area that that Sally Smith admitted to overlooking and you're going to make people start taking their job a lot more seriously if you're not being so protected in your position that you can't, that you can fuck up as much as and as often as you want and still go get your paycheck the next day. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, that's well, the most disappointing think, part. Uh, go, I'm sorry. No, um, I was just thinking about scrubs. Um, <laughs> uh, not, does the doctor, not Dr. Kelso, the guy above him, he's like the hospital administrator, sir, administrator or something. Yeah. He makes all the top down 
decisions. So he's responsible for everyone. So who's that at that hospital? Right. That person should be the face of this case and should be the one that should get prison time or at least some kind of uh, mm-hmm. face that they can put on the newspaper and say, this man is responsible for yeah. what happened here because he signed all of those invoices mm-hmm. and he told every doctor that they could continue to um, hold Maya against her will and that this certainly yeah. wasn't CRPS and it doesn't matter what the previous doctor did or diagnosed right. or what kind of treatments he had. This man signed off on it. Mm-hmm. Surely there is someone like that at the hospital. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. It's a big hospital. Of course there is. Yep. Um, you know, one, one interesting thing about the, the, the final trial that happened earlier this year, um, the hospital's attorneys are looking for a retrial after a claim that a member of the jury leaked information about the case to his wife, um, who then interfered with the trial by posting inside information on social media. So to me, it's oh a, God. To me, it's a last ditch grab to to try to get something, but the result's not going to be any different. You're going to get, you know, even if they granted a retrial, which they won't. I mean, I guess I don't know that, but I, I doubt that they will. You're still going to have the same trial. You're still going to have the same information. You're just going to have you just had a a juror who didn't do what he was supposed to do, and you're you're grasping at straws at that point. Is, is my opinion, mm-hmm. um, but it's a little something that was interesting anyway. Okay. That's the, that's the documentary folks. Um, Katie, how'd you, how do you feel after watching that? I feel very lucky. I don't know about you guys. (laughs) Yeah. 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 That's all I can say. I'm just lucky that that didn't happen to me. I think it's called schadenfreude when you're glad that something didn't happen to you. Okay. Um, And I'm glad family got, money at least to mm-hmm. they'll never have to worry about health care ever again i mean they'll worry about who they're going to but they yeah. won't worry about having to pay for it yeah so that's something but also um hopefully that this is given enough press at least in that town in that hospital that more people can come forward mm-hmm. with their cases and have them heard and maybe get some justice the same way that the that family did yeah and and i wouldn't be surprised if we start start seeing you know, Maya as a, um, maybe a, a face for this sort of situation and, and become an advocate for the, so those sort of things or, or, or the, her dad, Jack or brother or something like that, you know, uh, Bryce, how about you? How, how are you feeling after the credits roll or while they're rolling? Oh man. Uh, big, sad, big, sad. Yep. <laughs> um, cause it, it starts out, you know, you have this beautiful montage of this family and then this whole documentary. And then it ends with sort of this montage of all these other families Uh, that are locked up and having their kids taken away. And it's like, this is not a single case. It is so much more. Yep. And that leaves you with a certain feeling of, uh, uh, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, you know, for me, I I didn't feel great when credits rolled, you know, like at that point I hadn't looked up the results of the case yet either and or the trial I should say and I mean, I'm glad to know that the trial happened and that the Kowalski's won the trial and you know how heartbreaking would it have been if they had their trial and it, they were the there was no guilt given to the hospital at all and and no admission of any of that, you know. Um it, when you, you know, with Dr. Sally Smith settling, it's like, you kind of know that you don't have a leg to stand on. So you settle and you, you, you know, and it, it is what I, it is, but holy shit, this was a sad one. <laughs> this is, you know, I think yeah. probably top sad, sad, sad. And uh, from, from what, and what we've watched, it's scary. If you have kids, be careful, you know, when, if, if you are a kid, be careful you know, it's, it's just, it's just so much, so much thing, so many things that in the world that we have to be cautious of, and it's, it's disheartening and it's tiresome and it's, you know, uh, it's scary. So, um, should we rate the thing? 
Let's rate it. Let's rate this thing. Uh, finally, we've come to the time where we need to rate this documentary with an official documentary rating. Each crew member scores the documentary on a scale of one to ten items, with one being as bad as Dr. Sally Smith and ten being as great <laughs> as a news article that cracks open the truth about the monsters in our systems. The item that is used for scoring changes each week depending on the content of the documentary that we watch. This week, we will be using ketamine doses as our rating item. So let's start with Katie. Katie, how many ketamine doses do you give Take Care of Maya? I give eight ketamine doses. Eight ketamine doses. Um, so despite all of the the sad subject matter, you thought this was a very good documentary worth eight this is probably one of the best that we've ever watched mm -hmm. if not the best this is the highest rating that i've given but yeah. i mean not only do we have the emotional factor but there's also just very good reporting mm -hmm. and we're so lucky that they were such so good at documenting um oh, yeah. was so good at documenting everything that was happening that we were able to follow it so closely and to watch it unfold after her death when they could take it to court and say guess what we've got you we have everything and yeah. then to then find out um, that the invoices all said CRPS, it was just right. it was it was justice. It yep. felt like justice, at least in some way. Yep, yep, I I agree. Thanks, Katie. Mm. Bryce, mm. how many ketamine doses, sir? Uh, I too am giving it eight ketamine doses. Eight whole shots of ketamine. Yep. Tell me why. Uh, I learned I learned a lot. Um, yeah. And it was a very good documentary. Mm -hmm. um, it leaves you questioning things, and um, you know, uh, so it's not a, it's not a perfect ten, but yeah. it's it's dang good. And yep. uh, yeah, I learned a lot. Yep, agreed. I also gave this eight ketamine doses. Um, similar to you guys, you know, in order to get a ten, um, I have to walk away feeling pretty good feeling pretty empowered, feeling pretty inspired. It's hard for me to want to give something that leaves me feeling so sad, um, a, a 10 or a nine, just because, uh, you know, I, I don't love that we have to watch a documentary about this because it's a thing. Um, but in the world of documenting what's happening and telling us in a compelling way of what some of the dangers are in our systems, I mean, documentaries are the, 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 th the vehicle that can do that in a way that that keeps us interested, keeps us uh, engaged, and this one did all of those things. It told a good story. Um, was it biased? Yeah, it was. Um, you know that it, it was not made in the. It didn't give the 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 hospital side much of a a um, positive light or try to give their story. It did, did you know. If you're watching, you do understand some of those things, but um, I don't, you know, it didn't, it was a biased documentary for sure. When, when the other side defers to say anything, that's kind of a... Agreed. Yep. When all, when all they said at the end was, we take everything very seriously and, you know, we feel that we did the best that we could with what we knew, you know, well... You, you're if, if you're just like you said if you're not saying anything if you decline to say anything well then i'm going to tell the story of the people who did mm -hmm. and you know chances are that's going to be more close to accurate anyway so eight ketamine doses so after averaging everyone's scores together the official documentary rating for for take care of maya okay so eight 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 um eight ketamine doses if i'm doing my math correctly Thank you all for listening. It's always a good time. Even if the subject matter isn't the most up uplifting and encouraging, I still like talking to you guys about it. Um, and I also like hanging out with Bryce and Katie. So thanks, guys, for Katie. I'm glad you were able to to tune in over the Internet since you're not in town. <laughs> um, so thanks for being here. Bryce. Thanks. It was a joy. Yep. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Of course. Okay, true believers, shall we talk about next week's episode? Yeah. Yeah. A wise man once said, <laughs> quote, with great power, there must also come great responsibility, unquote. So it's time to put on your gold and red armor. 
grab your web shooters and assemble to see if you are worthy to lift the mighty Mjolnir because for our 50th episode, I am taking us into the world of something very near and dear to my heart. That is right, the world of Marvel comic books. Um, we are going to be looking into the into 100 years of influence by one of the godfathers of comic books and the creator of some of, some of the biggest characters ever to grace comics, cartoons, movies, toys, and so, so, so much more. We'll be watching a one hour and 26 minute documentary called Stan Lee. You guys comic book fans at all? Marvel fans, anything like that? I love the movies. Yeah. Yep. Katie? Yep. Yep. Movies, yep. Yep. Yeah, so I've been, I've been, um, so my dad got me into comic books when I was very, very young, and he and I are both still very into them. Um, when the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe became a thing, I was, uh, very, very into that, seeing those characters turn into, uh, into, you know, big screen icons and just start to grow. And, uh, you know, to me, this is wonderful. I love, you know, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby and, and everything that they, came up with some of the most iconic characters that that we have in our uh media today um so disney plus comes out with a stan lee documentary and i go bingo i go excelsior <laughs> because that is that is what what we are going to watch so go check out stan lee before next week's episode it can be streamed like i said on disney plus um as i said at the beginning of our show rate and review our podcast follow us on all the stuff Next week, join us as we excelsior one documentary at a time uh, on behalf of Lady Katie. Hi, Katie. On behalf of Bruce Bruce. Yep. Hi, Bruce. <laughs> Matt and DJ in that post-production booth and the entire documentary family. I am your host, Jeff Kalaski. I want to thank you all for listening. I hope you keep your minds open and be kind to each other and be careful when you go to the hospital um, because you never know. So, all right. Bye, everybody. Welcome, everybody, to Talkumentary Secret Trivia. If you've been listening to the quiet after our episode for this long, it's time for a little secret trivia. Uh, the the uh, subject matter of this week's episode was a little bit a little bit sad, but Katie mentioned the show Scrubs. So guess what? We're gonna do a Scrubs trivia. We've got a couple questions for you here, pulled off of um, FunTrivia.com. Let's. Uh, okay, let's see. I don't know this show as well as you guys seem to, so I, I don't know if these are hard or easy, but here we go. Number one, who is the actor that plays Chris Turk? Uh, Anyone? Shit, I don't know. Can't think of his name. He also does a voice. Uh, <laughs> so he, so Zach Braff plays JD. Yep. John C. McGinley plays Dr. Cox, and Neil Flynn plays the janitor. Chris Turk is played by... Last chance. He was also in Clueless. <laughs> Donald Faison. Mm. Oh, my God. We saw that name for so many years. <laughs> Donald. I should... Okay, let's see. It was just the phase, Don. <laughs> just a phase on yep um uh, why is there silverware in the pancake drawer <laughs> why is there pancakes in the silverware drawer <laughs> <laughs> okay where did jd grow up i don't know if he ever did uh, <laughs> good point <laughs> i want I want to say Oregon. You have the first letter of the state correct, but not the state. Ohio. Yeah. Ohio. Tr Troutwood, Ohio. <laughs> yep. In season four, episode two, JD makes friends with a furniture moving company worker, and the worker has a very strange knowledge of JD's early years, including his hometown. Okay. Um, do you know who sings the main theme from Scrubs? 
Um, I did at one point. Does... <laughs> but no. No, I don't know. Laszlo Bain. Dang. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, let's see. Way couple, to go, Laszlo. A couple more here. <laughs> um, John Ritter, star of Three's Company, appeared on Scrubs as a relative of JD. How was he related? Brother? Uncle, right? Neither of you are correct. <laughs> dad, it was his dad. It was his dad, yep. Uh, this was one of John Ritter's last appearances before his passing. His appearance reminded JD that great things can come from humble beginnings, and JD himself became a doctor thanks to his father's hard work as a salesman. Okay, let's do one more. Yes, you... Who said the line, if I find a penny in there, I'm taking you down? That's the janitor. <laughs> <laughs> this quote was from the pilot episode titled my first day this particular quote happens while jd is waiting outside the door while the janitor is trying to fix it jd attempts to make small talk but fails and thus the rivalry begins this has been another and he was also supposed to be a Harry yes until oh. the end of season one and then they were he was so good <laughs> that's awesome this has been another episode of Documentary Secret Trivia. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, be kind to each other. Keep those minds open and do all the cool shit that you want to do in your life. We love you. Have a good night. Bye, everybody. Bye.